Howdy. This is the introduction to diffraction, um, and we're going to really start thinking about how do we use X-ray radiation to learn something about a crystal structure. Uh, but before we get there, we need to talk about diffraction in general. And diffraction is a very general um, phenomenon that basically happens anytime a wave interacts with a periodic structure. And so what we're doing is we're thinking about some incident um, uh, some incident uh, electromagnetic radiation um, that has some particular wavelength, um, and we see it interacts with some structure. And so this is uh, a diffraction grating. Um, you can see diffraction if you simply um, shine a laser beam, so uh, a laser pointer, for example, that has a fixed wavelength, through a diffraction grating. And this can be just as easy as uh, transparency with a bunch of lines, uh, horizontal or vertical lines. And what happens is if you shine that laser pointer through the transparency, um, you will see wherever it's projected, you know, hopefully this is on a wall some distance away, you'll see a bunch of spots. And these spots are what we call diffraction spots. Um, and they happen uh, because you have constructive and destructive interference when that wave is interacting with the grating. So if we think very carefully about what comes through here, and you know, again, this is assuming that we have a coherent wave. So all of the um, the wavelength is in seek, seek uh, with uh, with uh, um, the other photons. So all of the photons are what we call coherent. These wavelengths are lining up. Um, then we can ask what happens for a wave that travels and passes through one slit or passes through another slit. Uh, and what we see is um, based on the separation between the slits, and, and in this case, we're going to call that distance A, um, well, at the end of the day, what we want to know is, does the path difference result in um, a constructive interference? And constructive interference would be when there's an integral number of wavelengths. So each of these waves uh, starts to add up uh, and create a spot at the end of the day. Um, and so the, uh, the general equation that describes whether or not we see a diffraction spot um, is if this path difference, this distance, which again, if A is the separation here and uh, phi is the angle of takeoff, um, A times the sine of phi is given by this, uh, this length, the path difference, if that equals an integral number of wavelengths. So if it adds up to a, an even integer number of wavelengths, then you have constructive interference, and if it doesn't, you have destructive interference. And what that means is that at the end of the day, we have a spot from the laser that shines right through the slit, but at some height above, um, there is a diffraction spot. And really, we don't think about this as a height, but we think about it as an angle. What angle phi uh, results in constructive interference? Um, so we can think about a couple quick things. First of all, what is going to happen as that spacing increases? Um, or maybe alternatively, as I ask it here, is the spacing between the, the pattern lines decreases. So if this uh, distance A gets smaller, what is going to happen um, to the separation between these spots? And if we look at the equation, we see that if A gets smaller, the sine of the angle or the angle itself has to get larger, um, given that this value is fixed. So as the spacing between the pattern lines decreases, the spacing diffra between diffraction spots increases. Similarly, what would happen if we changed the wavelength? So if we went from red to green, red is a longer wavelength. Uh, red optical light has a longer wavelength than green. Um, and so now we're changing the value of lambda, the wavelength of light. And so if the wavelength decreases, what should happen to the spacing between the diffraction spots. The wavelength is lambda. The spacing, again, we think about it in terms of an angle. Uh, and if lambda decreases, then this angle, uh, the sine of theta and theta itself also has to decrease. Um, so uh, what we've learned is that um, the spacing between these is inversely proportional to the distance, the real space distance between lines. And there's a relationship between the diffraction spots and the wavelength itself. Now, if we think about a two-dimensional system, so let's just think about a, 
a grid that has vertical lines and horizontal lines, these spacing distances might not be the same. So maybe we have a distance A and a distance B, um, but that's okay because at the end of the day, then we're gonna get a, a, a grid of points um, and the vertical spacing between, let's say, this point and the one down here is inversely proportional to that distance A, so the, space, the vertical spacing between lines, and the horizontal separation is inversely uh, proportional to B, the horizontal separation between lines. Um, and that's basically because both of these expressions would have to hold in order to see a diffraction spot. Now, diffraction is a very useful technique for material science. Um, we use it in uh, transmission electron microscopy. Um, uh, sorry, I garbled that. Transmission electron microscopy. And that's basically where we shine electrons uh, through um, a sample. Uh, in this case, that's the object. Um, they get focused, and we can basically see either a diffraction pattern or an image based on where we put the detector. Um, and so the diffraction pattern is basically just a snapshot of this thing, where now our, uh, our wave that's coming in is electrons. Because remember, one thing that quantum mechanics taught us is that we could treat electrons as either particles or as waves. Um, so, you know, we're gonna, uh, return to the question of reciprocal space in a following video, um, but I, I do want to really hammer home this point. So we have uh, the object that we're looking at, um, and the separations here are what we call real space. You know, I could measure the distance between one line and another. Similarly, if I'm looking at a crystal, I could measure the distance between one plane of atoms and another. That's real space. The unit should be meters or nanometers, angstrom, something like that. However, the diffraction pattern itself um, is, is, occupies what we call reciprocal space. And that's just because, again, the distance between one diffraction spot and another is inversely proportional to their spacing in real space. Um, so whereas in real space, uh, we can think about the separation between planes and we can think about it in terms of uh, units of length or meters, uh, in reciprocal space, the separation between one diffraction spot and another uh, are given in terms of inverse length units or inverse meters. Um, again, we're going to come back to reciprocal space later. Uh, so final question is if we're interested in atomic length scales, remember um, what we'd like to do is use some kind of radiation to probe uh, a unit cell to see where atoms actually are. What wavelength of radiation do you think we should use? And not surprisingly, what we want to do is we want to find a wavelength that is uh, about uh, a, a very similar range to the length scale of the periodicity of the atoms that we're looking at. Um, uh, and that's principally because we want to, at the end of the day, we want to use a fixed lambda. So we, we monochromate our beam. We know what wavelength is coming into the sample. Um, we can set n to be equal to 1. We want to know something about lattice parameters. Uh, and in order to know that, we would like to be able to measure this value easily. Um, so for this to be true, uh, n lambda has to be uh, on the order of the distance of A, the separation between atoms. Uh, and that means that we want to find a, uh, a, a radiation that has a wavelength on the order of angstroms. Um, and that's exactly why we use x-rays to look at crystal structures because X-rays have the right wavelength so that it's easy to measure something that's telling us about the spacing between individual planes of atoms.